Good morning, and welcome to the Great Kills Moravian Church on this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Just a couple of announcements today. Please continue prayers for um, Rhonda Robinson, also Charlie's brother Vincent in Florida, um, for the families and that lost loved ones in Haiti with the earthquakes, and for any families that might be affected by this hurricane or tropical storm as it is now. So, yes? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Our watchword for the week. Jesus said, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Please stand for our gathering hymn, O Jesus, I have promised. Our liturgy today is the liturgy of discipleship. What shall we render to the Lord for all his bounty to us? We will offer the sacrifices of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord.
Gracious God, for revealing yourself to us as one who created all things, who gave us dominion over all the earth, who called us into a covenant relationship with you, who has given us the privilege of being your ambassadors in the world, who loves you as your children through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We give you our heartfelt thanks. be seated. Jesus Christ, our Savior, Savior, because you were willing to come to earth in the likeness of humanity, to take the form of a servant, because you became obedient until death, even death on a cross, because God has highly exalted you and bestowed on you the name which is above every name, that at your name every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. We humbly bow before you with praise and adoration. Spirit, for dwelling within us and calling us to God by the gospel, for preserving us in the true faith, for leading the church on earth in its mission, for pointing the way of discipleship to each of us. We acknowledge your presence and power among us. Jesus said, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there shall, be my, there shall my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. We hear your call to discipleship. Master, teach us the way we should go. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should abide. Now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain.
confess, Lord, that as your disciples, we have often dishonored the holy name we bear. We ask your forgiveness for the times we have failed to labor for your kingdom, when we have not followed your admonition to seek first the kingdom of God, when we have hidden our light from the world, when we, as the salt of the earth, have lost our strength. Have mercy on us and restore unto us the joy of faithful discipleship. Amen. The Lord, your Redeemer, has said, with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you. Therefore, serve the Lord with gladness. Witness to his goodness and mercy and preach Jesus Christ as Lord with yourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. Please stand as you're able. Please be seated. God's word for today. Um, the first reading is from Joshua 24, verses 1 through 2 and 14 through 18. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Naor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped other gods. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord, our God himself, who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed the, those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Our second reading is a responsive reading from Psalm 34, verses 15 through 22. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, who blot out their names from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked, the foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants, 
no one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Last week, when we worshiped, we didn't read the readings for Sunday. We used the readings for the festival of um, our renewal, our Moravian Pentecost. So I'm going to read a little more than is written for what the gospel is today. I'm going to start at verse 51, chapter John, verse 6. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day, for my flesh is true blood, my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the son of man ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit that gives life, the flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12, yet one of you is a devil? He was speaking of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. For though one of the 12 was going to betray Jesus. Here ends the reading from John. Back in my earth mother days, when my children were little, I baked our weekly family bread. I loved the working of yeast and flour and the liquid and salt and kneading that dough and pounding on it and pushing it around. It was absolutely therapeutic. And I think that watching and waiting as bread dough rises is somehow both magical and very mystical. And the smells. The smell of the yeast when it first begins to dissolve with water and sugar. There's no other smell that compares. It's just that yeastiness that you can feel and smell in the kitchen, that living thing. When you punch down the dough and poke all those pockets of air where that yeasty carbon dioxide has been released, there's also more fragrance. And then there's the baking. Nothing compares, well, maybe chocolate chip cookies, but nothing else compares to the smell 
of freshly baking bread, that aroma that just fills the entire house. As soon as any loaf was cool enough to handle, the children were there in the kitchen waiting for that very ickily sliced first loaf of bread. It was too hot to slice, but we did anyway. And we had a tea party and we had freshly sliced bread with butter melting on top that just sort of oozed and dripped all over your fingers. It was really very heavenly. Over time, I learned to make a variety of shapes. For a while, when the children decided they didn't like crust, I baked bread in juice cans, those tall juice cans, right? Because then there was no crust on the sides and there was none of that whining or complaining. Um, I learned how to cook with a variety of grains and use them and then different seasonings and flavorings depended on what I was trying to create. I even managed croissants once just to prove that I could do it. I also love quick breads. My mother grew up in North Carolina. So I learned from her and my grandmother and my aunties how to make what was their daily bread, which was biscuits, biscuits and cornbread. I have never been able to make cornbread like my mother, but I did master biscuits. And I taught my daughter, Elizabeth, loves to make biscuits. And just this weekend, I taught my grandson, Jackson, the nine-year-old who loves to be a chef, how to cook biscuits. Women of every culture seem to have found ways to grind grain into some kind of flour that could be mixed with liquid and any kind of rising ingredient, even just wild yeast, and prepare food that sustains life. Pita, sourdough, rye bread, tortillas, corn cakes, whole wheat, Focaccia, brioche, multigrain, baguettes, among my favorite baguettes, challah, oatmeal bread, zucchini bread with chocolate chips, of course, raisin, garlic, banana, scones, biscuits, Irish soda bread, grain, and grace. The bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And the crowd said, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said, I, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This chapter, which we've been reading for the whole month of August, began with the feeding of the 5,000, that miraculous distribution and multiplication of those loaves and fishes, the hands of Jesus, reaching out and feeding each and every man, woman, and child present that evening. The crowds have been following him as he moved around the Sea of Galilee and the various shores because they like that he's feeding them and they don't want to be hungry anymore and they even want to make him king because after all, then we could eat always and we won't have to work. Jesus wisely manages to disappear and find ways of praying. There's that miraculous walk across the water where he again says, I am. He continues to teach, having dialogue back and forth as the crowd pushes back. What do you mean you are bread from heaven? We have our ancestors who had manna in the wilderness. And the Jewish leaders in the Capernaum synagogue who say, 
eating flesh? Is he crazy? What's he talking about? And even in today's lesson, those followers of Jesus named as disciples who say, I can't do this anymore. This is way too hard. Unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat and drink have eternal life. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I abide in them. This is a big deal to the evangelist who writes this gospel to John. He wants us to get and understand this new thing that Jesus is doing so that we will know what real, full, complete, honest life is and not be distracted by other things that offer life. Jesus is as connected to us and we to him as much as Jesus and the Father are connected to one another and abide in one another. We abide because we share in bread and wine, flesh and blood. That's the teaching Jesus shared in a synagogue in Capernaum. It's the lesson that John shares with us in this church building, on this Sabbath, I am the bread of life. There's a couple of little hidden treasures in the English translation that get lost when we move them over from Greek. That place where the disciples, some of the disciples say this teaching is too difficult, who can accept it? The word is not really teaching. The word in Greek is logos, which means literally word. This logos, this word is too difficult. Who can accept it? If you take your mind all the way back to John chapter one that we often read on Christmas morning, in the beginning was the word, the logos. And the word, logos, was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. This logos. This word is too difficult. And Jesus responds by saying, does this offend you? But the word that's really there is, does this scandalize you? Do you find this to be just really awful and scandalous? Then, oh my gosh, if you think this is scandalous, wait until we get to the death, resurrection, and ascension at the end. That's the real scandal. What will you do with that? Jesus is the word that is the bread of life that has come down to us from heaven. Unlike the bread in the wilderness where the people ate it and died anyway, this carries real life eternal life that begins here in our physical form and continues after this physical form is long gone. The words that I speak to you are spirit and life. But among you are some who do not believe. Because of this word, 
many of his disciples turned back. They just quit. They were not able to follow him anymore. They gave up. This is really serious business in John because choosing to no longer follow Jesus is John's definition of betrayal. It's not just Judas. It's anyone who turns their back on the Lord. I don't believe this. I don't think what you're saying is right. I don't trust that this is the truth. And then Jesus asks the question that is pivotal for the whole first six chapters of this gospel. It's kind of the tipping point. Do you also wish to go away? Do you also wish to leave me? Do you also wish to betray me? From John's perspective, there are only two options available to us. Stay, abide in Jesus, or turn your back and leave, not believe, not trust. Do you choose to abide or do you also wish to go away? There's no lukewarm response. There's no, okay, I'm going to have one foot with Jesus, but the other foot in the rest of the world, and I'll figure out how to make it work. Nope. John says not an option. There is no middle ground. One stays or one leaves. Do you also wish to go away? This Jesus, this logos, this bread from heaven. Earlier, again, in chapter one, John writes, he came to his own and his own did not accept him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God children of God, and the word became flesh and lived among us, abided, dwelt, remained, stayed among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the source of life, John tells us, and Jesus cares about what happens in this life, in this physical realm. And Jesus cares about what happens also as we continue in eternal life into the other realm. The meal he offers is absolute grace, unconditional love, pure welcome. I will feed you. And I don't want to be your king, not the kind of king you're thinking of, because that's not what God's power and love are about. Grace and glory are mixed. Glory is not that big, you know, pompous, majestic, all-powerful kind of way we think of world leaders. The glory is in sacrifice and humility and giving of myself for the sake of the other Grace and glory are interwoven. God in the flesh, in Jesus, bringing grace and life, real life. Zoe, that's the word. That's my granddaughter's name. Zoe is the word for life. The word became flesh. God became flesh in Jesus, bringing grace and truth, we are flesh, and the word abides in us. Jesus nurtures us through the water, through the bread and the cup, and then sends us out just as the Father sent him, 
the Holy One of God. And there will always be temptation. We will always fall short. Even knowing that I abide in the wholeness of Jesus and that Jesus abides in me, I will inevitably betray him probably more than once on any given day by living by somebody else's rules and ways, by not living according to how Jesus has invited. And the really significant thing, though, is that Jesus himself never, never turns away. Jesus never betrays us. I choose you, he says at the end. I choose you today and always. I am the bread of life. Come to me and you'll never be hungry. Trust in me and you'll never be thirsty. You will be filled with life. Do you also wish to go away? Where is your desire to abide with me forever? And I can hear Jesus as I say, yes, I choose abiding. I can hear Jesus say, it's really awesome. Pull up a chair. Let's break bread together. Amen. We turn to the hymn, God of grace and God of glory.
let us come to God in a time of prayer. Holy God, you offer us all manner of blessing. We have bread and homes and clothing and shoes, and we assist and try to bring those gifts to those who do not have them. Help us be most especially grateful for the bread of life, the love of Jesus Christ through you and in you that sustains our life, whose very presence nurtures and feeds us and becomes part of who we are. Holy One of God, blessed Jesus, we give you thanks for always being with us, never abandoning or betraying us. Help us to live that model as we live with our families, our church family, in our places of work, in all the places that we serve and witness that we are indeed the children of God. Spirit of God, spirit that gives life, spirit that lives within us. We pray for your ever moving presence, your dynamic life here among us now. We pray not only for us and our mission and the work that we carry out for you. We pray it also for all of those who are in need this day. We remember those for whom the hurricane is currently pounding their shores and homes with rain and wind that can tear things apart. We pray for the people of Haiti, your children, who just never seem to get a break, Lord. Another earthquake has devastated, killing many and filling destruction everywhere. We pray for those who take the time to find food and water and share love and find shelter. We pray for our armed forces struggling with odds beyond compare with a job that seems impossible as they seek to evacuate those in Kabul. We pray that you would keep all safe, that your presence would be known, that there would be less fear. We remember those who are ill, in body, mind, or spirit. We give you thanks for your presence here, for all those who have come to be in worship here and around the world. May we be fed with your word, the gift of the bread of life. We offer all our prayers in the name of Christ, who is that bread that nurtures us. Amen. Holy hands have crocheted and knit these prayer shawls before us on this table. I love this abundance and the amount of color. I invite you to join me as we offer prayers of blessing over all these shawls right now. Holy God, thank you for the hands that pulled together yarn with needles and hooks and prayed with each stitch for the person who would receive it. Thank you for blessing these hands with creativity and presence and the joy of serving. We don't know where each one of these shawls will end up, Lord, but we send them from this place as you send us, that they may be witness to your presence and love through us and what we do that they may bring comfort and healing, that the person on whose shoulders each shawl sits will feel the loving arms of this community of faith and through that warmth and gentleness will know your desire for their healing, for the best outcome possible for what is happening in their lives. We bless these shawls and give you thanks for this ministry that we can share with such grace and bring you glory. We pray in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord. Amen. 
We turn now to a time of blessing our offerings, those offerings that are in the plate, the offerings of the prayer shawls, and the other offerings that you bring from your heart. We sing together for the fruit of all creation. Let us pray together. Loving God, there is no way to repay you for all we have received from your hands. Yet we want to give our best to the work you call us to do through this community of seekers. We enter with renewed commitment and confidence and costly venture of spreading love through your world. Amen. Please join me in offering the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive her those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. We join in singing, stand up, stand up for Jesus.
out from here and lives lives worthy of the calling which we all share in humility, gentleness, and patience, speak only what is true and loving and so grow into the unity that is ours in Christ. And may God, the creator, reshape your hearts. May Christ Jesus, the bread of life, sustain you always. And may the Holy Spirit unite you in the bond of peace. We go in peace and love to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you.